So I ask everyone to turn to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. And if you're using the Bible that we pass out here, this would be page number 539. We're in Proverbs chapter 16. For any of you that are not familiar with Proverbs, it comes in this very center of the Bible in a section known as the poetry section of Scripture. So this portion of the Bible, if you were to read it in the language that it was originally written in, which is Hebrew, it's written as poetry. The special focus of Proverbs, and I mentioned this on Sunday because we were looking at a verse of Proverbs on Sunday, Proverbs is about God's wisdom for living. And I mentioned this on Sunday that the word for wisdom, the Hebrew word, means skill. How do you live your life with skill as a husband, as a father, as an employee, as a neighbor? Uh, how do you handle wine with skill? How do you handle money with skill? How do you have a work ethic? Proverbs talks about everything that involves life. And it's actually God's wisdom for it. This is like God telling you, here's how to handle this situation with skill. That's what Proverbs is about. Very interestingly, Proverbs has 31 chapters in it. Because of that, there are, you know, there are 31 days in several months of the year. A lot of people have made it a habit in their lives to read one chapter of Proverbs every day of their life, the day that corresponds with the month. So today is November the 3rd. People that have done that, they read Proverbs chapter 3, tomorrow Proverbs chapter 4. That would be a great lifelong habit to get into. Now, for those of you that have not been here, we have gone through already the first 15 chapters of Proverbs. So now we begin chapter 16. Those of you that are coming for the first time, you now are joining us. We're halfway through the book of Proverbs. Now, what we do is, the way Proverbs is written is different from other books of the Bible. Because Proverbs is written topically. So in other words, Proverbs in one chapter and one verse will talk about a certain topic, and then two chapters later we'll talk about it again. Ten verses later we'll talk about it again. Four chapters later we'll talk about it again. So the, way, the right way to study Proverbs is take all the verses that deal with that topic and deal with it at one time. So every sentence of Proverbs is like a wisdom statement. It's like going, you know, I hate to even compare it to this, but you need to you go to a Chinese restaurant, you open up a thing, and there's a, a statement, a sentence. This is not, this is God's word. This is not a Chinese proverb, okay? This is far different. So it's a very poor analogy. Yeah, but, but the only comparison is, is that it is one sentence. But don't think about it as a fortune cookie, please. This is God's word. No, I just planted that in your head. Yes, thank you, Stacey. Yeah. So, but they are one-sentence statements of wisdom. So the way that if you're going to read Proverbs is you want to go through and say, okay, what does Proverbs say about money? Take all the references together. You'll have a presentation of God's wisdom about money. And so on. Tonight we come to a new topic in Proverbs that we have not looked at yet. And it's introduced to us in verse 1. Notice what it says in Proverbs 16, verse 1. Now, before I tell you this, I want to tell you guys, when I was in college, I remember I began my senior year of college, and I had been presented with a couple of interesting opportunities for the following summer. I could potentially go and travel with this kind of collegiate team that would go different parts of the country. I could go to a summer camp and be a counselor up in North Carolina. I could go back to Rhode Island, where I was from, and take a job. I had a bunch of interesting, all of them had good reasons to do them. And I was trying to figure out, what should I do? What does God want me to do? Does God have a will about this? And I remember my mentor in college said, you know, Ted, there's one chapter in the Bible that especially is helpful when you're trying to figure out what does God want me to do. And he said, it's Proverbs 16. So I went to a seminary professor. I went to my, my Hebrew professor in seminary, and I said, you know, I really want to understand this chapter. And he dealt with verse 1. He said, okay, let me tell you what this is saying. And so I didn't, I didn't, he didn't know what God's will is for me, 
But what he did know was what Proverbs 16 was saying. And it was helpful for me to really think about it because then I took some things that I heard from here and it really helped me to make a wise decision. You say, which one did you do? I went to the camp in North Carolina. But understanding some truths out of this chapter helped me to make a wise decision. Because you know what this chapter does in a few places, and it does this in other places, we're going to look at the whole topic tonight in Proverbs, it introduces one of the three ways that God makes his will known. God's will is his desire, what he wishes. Okay? The Bible tells us there are three ways that God makes his will known in the life of his children. We'll talk about those in a few minutes. But this chapter especially focuses on one of those ways. And it's introduced in verse 1. Notice what it says in Proverbs 16, verse 1. The plans of the heart belong to man. Now, let me tell you, the, the Hebrew word plan is the word for arrangements or the preparations. So here you are, you're trying to make arrangements about your life. Like, I want this to happen, so I'm going to do this, this, this. I've got a, I've got a game plan here. Bible says to man belong the arrangements, the preparations. You know, he, he wants to see this happen, so he's making these plans and arrangements and preparations. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. That phrase, the answer of the tongue, you could basically summarize in English as the response. So man is making arrangements. He's making preparations. He's looking at his life and saying, okay, I, I want to, you know, this I think is the wisest thing or whatever. So while he's making his arrangements and preparations, God has something that he wants to say about that. Arrangements and preparations belong to man, but the response is from the Lord. Now watch, it happens, look at verse 9. We have this topic again. Notice while verse 9 says it. The heart of man plans his way. This is a slightly different word for plan in the Hebrew language. It's a word that means devises his way. The heart of man is devising it. He's scheming it. He's plotting it out. I'm going to do this and this and this and this. The heart of man plans his way, but... The Lord establishes. The word establish means to confirm, to direct, to order. So here I am. I am plotting, devising my next moves. I'm making arrangements. But God has something to say about it. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord is the one who is actually confirming or ordering or directing his steps. The word steps means his course of life. So here you are, you're making the best arrangements and devising the strategy the best you can, and meanwhile the Lord is actually ordering your steps. He's actually ordering the course of your life. Proverbs deals with this again in the very next chapter. Look at chapter 20 and verse 24. Chapter 20 and verse 24 says it this way. A man's steps are from the Lord. How then can man understand his way? So here again, we're out here, we're making arrangements, making preparations, and yet God has something he's doing in your life. He's ordering the course of your life. He's directing the course of your life while you're busy planning it. And sometimes because the fact Proverbs 20, 24 says, because your steps are from him, sometimes you don't understand what's happening. God, this wasn't part of my arrangements. This was not in the game plan. But God is doing something. Look at it one more time. This theme comes up in Proverbs, the very next chapter, chapter 21, verse 30. Look what it says in chapter 21 and verse 30. No wisdom, no understanding, no counsel. The word counsel is purpose. K 
can avail against the Lord. So you say, okay, I've got the perfect plan. I've got it all laid out. And God says, oh yeah, I have something I'm doing. And you, what your plans, I don't care what you're devising, your plans or preparations, if I say otherwise, otherwise is what's going to happen. For example, if you pause here, go with me, I'll show you an example of this, where God really tells rulers of the earth this is going to happen. Look at Psalm. This is the book before Proverbs. Right before Proverbs is Psalm, P-S-A-L-M, Psalm chapter 2. Notice what Psalm chapter 2 says. So if you go to the Psalms and you go to chapter 2, you see an illustration where, of the verse we just read, that no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel can avail against the Lord. I don't care how great your plans are. If God says otherwise, otherwise is what going to be. Look what Psalm 2 says. Verse 1, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? Chapter 2, verse 1. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. The human rulers of the earth say, we're sick and tired of God. We don't want him in our lives. We're going to get rid of him. We have all the power. Think about, guys, the rulers of the earth over the years have tried to have atheist governments. They are going to stamp out all faith. Every one of those governments has toppled. They had all the power. They had all the guns. That's why it's only a matter of time. North Korea will fall. Just like the Soviet Union. If you would have told someone back in the middle of the Cold War the mighty Soviet Union would fall apart within less than 100 years, that's exactly what happened. That's why China, China right now can try to dominate its citizens and follow them around with cameras and not allow them to say what they want and believe what they want and persecute Christians. I'm sorry, China, I have bad news. God's purpose is in stand. You can take up all the schemes you want to do and all the plans you want to do. And look at the Bible says in verse 4. How does God respond to all the plans of man? He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. I mean, in other words, he's like slapping his knees laughing. He thinks this is hilarious. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion. That's Jesus, my holy hill. I don't care what you guys say. Jesus will rule this earth. He's going to rule from Jerusalem. I get That's happening. Verse 7, I will tell the decree the Lord said to me, Jesus is now speaking, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage or your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. The Bible tells us that one day Jesus is going to return. And when Jesus returns, this time he will not come as a baby born in a manger. He is going to come as a conquering king. The next time Jesus comes, he is going to destroy all God's enemies. And it's not going to be pretty, and it's going to be fast. God's already decided. We already know how the story is going to end. Jesus will reign. The Bible says in the New Testament, from him and through him are to him are all things. God is going to give the world back to Jesus. The Bible says one day every knee will bow to him and every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord. All the religions that have denied that, that day they will say it. All the people in the world that thought they had all the power. You know, it's amazing sometimes people in this world, they get very arrogant they, because they can get away with everything. They've got all, like you think about some of the places they hate these gangs. They're all the tough guys. Who's going to stop them? One day they're going to be taken out of here that fast. And the very hair of the back of their neck, when they stand before the king of the universe, we'll see. The Bible says God is going to smash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now look how it ends, chapter 2. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun. You know when a king, you pay homage to a king, you kiss his ring. God is saying, kiss my son's ring. Lest he be angry and you perish in the way. 
for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. That's God's words to all the kings of the world who think they got it all in control. And I, I despise these wicked dictators in the world who abuse and misuse their people. And they think they got away with it. Remember, remember Saddam Hussein? I remember seeing the video still when Saddam Hussein became in power in Iraq in a very violent day, the day he took charge. He had a meeting about three or 400 people in that room. He had a bunch of guys in the room. They stood up. He said, I heard that you did not want me to be in charge of this country. And they could realize right in that room their lives were in danger at that moment. If you watch you watch this on YouTube, Saddam Hussein starts saying, take him out, take him out, take him out. They brought him right out of the room and killed him right in the spot. That guy was ruthless. And one day, justice was brought to him. But more than that, the real justice is when he stands before the king of the universe. I read this past week about Joseph Mengel. Joseph Mengel was the doctor of Adolf Hitler. Joseph Mengel was set to Auschwitz. This man was absolutely evil. They would take Jewish children and he would conduct experiments on them, inject them with drugs, watch them die horrible deaths. He would do things with twins. He would try to test them, you know, and once he was done with them, he'd kill them. This man was absolute evil personified. Joseph Mengel somehow there was a trial called the Nuremberg Trials right after World War II, and a bunch of these guys were executed. Joseph Mengel escaped. Joseph Mengel lived in Brazil into his 70s. He had a stroke and died. He was swimming at a beach. And I was thinking this past week, as far as Joseph Mengel was concerned, he got away with it. But the moment he opened his eyes upon death, he, Joseph Mengel is facing God's wrath this very night. The Bible says, I don't care what your schemes are and what your plots are, whatever the Lord says will be, will be. Now, we need to think about this, think about this in our own lives. I was just watching my father's here this week. I just watched a documentary about him, George Washington with my father called The First American. It was amazing. These guys were saying, I did not realize this, that George Washington, he became the general of the Continental Army at the age of 43. But they said in his 20s, George Washington narrowly escaped death time after time. He was fighting for the British, you know, in other wars. He was a general. They said there were so many times Washington was in battle and the guy right next to him gets blown away. Washington, between us two. This guy dies, Washington lives. They said there were times when Washington's horse got blown out from underneath him, Washington unscathed. Like this guy, his whole life is, how do you explain it? And they said that by the time Washington became the general of the Continental Army, he had such a conviction that God had spared his life for a reason. Now guys, what is this called? What is this thing called? It's called the name of this capital city, Providence. You know what Providence is? Providence is God's governing of all things for his wise and loving plan. That's Providence. Roger Williams named this town Providence because of his own story. Roger Williams, by the providence of God, by God's kind and loving governance of his life, made him very good with languages. He knew seven languages. He translated the first dictionary of the Indian language in America to English. Roger Williams made it across the Atlantic Ocean. He survived. Many people died on those voyages. He survives, gets to Plymouth Plantation, gets kicked out of Plymouth Plantation, and then in the winter of 1636, He's living in Salem, Massachusetts at the time. He hikes 55 miles on foot in January of 1636 in this incredible wilderness and survives. He finds Massasoit. Massasoit is the chief of the Wampanoag Indians, the man who celebrated the first Thanksgiving with the pilgrims. Massasoit shelters him or he would have died of exposure. 
He tries to settle in Riverside, what we call Riverside, Rhode Island today. Massasoit tried to give him land there. He got kicked out again. He had to get in a canoe and he crossed over what we call the Seekonk River, the Blackstone River, and he met the chief of the Narragansett Indians who gave him land. And William says, look at my life. It's the story of the providence of God. Look at all these things happen in my life. Who is the one that's moving this chess piece around? God is. Now, guys, this is something that we have to learn in our lives. You know, we it's wise of us to make preparations and to make plans. And, and, and we learn how to do that, by the way, through Scripture. But you need to be aware of this. One of the ways that God makes his will known, and again, there are three. I'm going to pause right now to tell you what they are. The first way the Scripture says God makes his will known in your life is through direct statements of Scripture. When God says, you shall not, that's his will. You don't have to ask any questions about it. When God says, you shall not steal, I don't have to ask. I know that's God's will. When God says, you shall not commit adultery, that's his will. There's no question about it. I don't have to ask, should I do this or not? Does God, I'm a married person, does God want me into this relationship? The answer is no. I know God's will. So God makes direct statements. You shall or you shall not. End of story. By the way, that's why you got to know what the Bible says. You'll know God's will. That's one of the ways he tells you point blank. You shall or you shall not. Okay, that one's settled. The second thing God does in Scripture, he doesn't make direct statements, but he'll give you principles. For example, in the New Testament it says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do, all, do it all to God's glory. In other words, make sure whatever you do, God would get honor from it. You say, you know, God doesn't tell you every last thing in the world, don't do this, you know, don't do that. No, because there's a lot of things you face in life. But what it gives you is general principles. Make sure in this situation, if whatever you do, do something that would give God honor. If it doesn't honor God, don't do it. Well, that helps to guide you, you know. You say, you know what, should I really, like you were mentioned earlier, Scott, you said, you know, I don't go hang around the bars anymore. I don't go do this anymore. You know, there are some people that they can have a glass of wine and it's not a problem. They can do it in a way that they, they are not, they are not pursuing intoxication. And for them, they might be able to do that to God's honor and, and say, God, I thank you for the gift of uh, the fruit of the vine. I enjoy it for what it is, but I pursue nothing more from it. Maybe they could do that get to God's honor. Romans 14 says that could be the case. Another person, he can't because, man, he's putting, for him, he knows what he's doing. He's putting himself in that place. He can't do it to God's honor. The Bible actually says to Christians, whatever you can't do in good faith, it's sin. If you don't, in your own heart, say, no, I, I don't think this is right, then you shouldn't do it. So that's a principle. That's one way God makes his will known through direct statements or through general principles. So number one, I did ask myself, as I'm thinking about my life, should I do this, should I not do this? Ask myself, number one, has God made any direct statements about it or are there any general principles about it that I need to take into account? If you say, okay, what I'm thinking about doing, what I would like to do, lines up with Bible statements or principles, okay, that's fine. The next thing you want to ask yourself, what's the second way God makes his will known? The Bible says the second way he makes his will known is through the desires of your heart. Watch this. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. This is in the New Testament. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. This is page 981, if you're using the Bible that we pass out here. Page 981, Philippians chapter 2. Notice verse 13. I'm going to ask Stacy to read this verse. Page 981, Philippians 2, verse 13. What does it say? For it, for it is of God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So it is God who is at work in you both to will. What does that mean? To want. So we're in chapter 2, verse 13, page 981. God is the one who is at work in you both to want and to work his good pleasure. So this is really what God wants you to do, but he's working your heart so you're going to want it too. So what does a Christian do? Pay attention to the desires of your heart. That's very possible It's because that's God's will for you. He's working in you what he wants you to do. Now, 
always check your heart against Bible statements and principles. Sometimes your heart is going to deceive you. You know, your heart, as the Bible says, is deceptive. So, always check what your heart's telling you against what Scripture says. If, if your heart's telling you something that the Scripture says God says you shall not, I don't care what your heart says, do what God says. Or if there are any principles. But let's say what you're wanting it lines up with Bible statements and principles, and it's also what you want. Okay? Great. There's one more way God makes his will known. He makes his will known through acts of providence, through the way he governs the affairs of your life. You say, and I'll show you an example of this. Look at the book of Acts in the New Testament, chapter 16. Acts 16, now this would be page 925. Acts chapter 16. I'm going to look at an example of how God does an act of providence in a person's life to show you his will. Notice Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 6. I'm going to ask Armando to read this from verses 6 to 10, if you would, Armando. Sure. Um, the Macedonian call. And they went through the region of... Some tough names are Phrygia and Galatia. Phrygia and Galatia. Having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, and when they come up to Mysia, Mysia, Mysia they attempted to go to into Bithynia, Bithynia uh, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Tro Troas. Troas, and and a vision appeared to Paul. In the night, a man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So watch this. Here's the Apostle Paul. He wants to go here. It's a good desire. It lines up with Scripture, and the Lord doesn't let him. So he says, I want to go here. The Lord doesn't let him. His desire is good. It lines up with Scripture, and yet it doesn't happen. God keeps doing, nope, that's not where I want you, Paul. you got a good desire, it's a fine desire, but that's not where I want you. Oh, but I hear, nope, I want you there. He gets him where he wants him. He does it through acts of providence. So, guys, when you're trying to figure out God's will for your life, ask yourself three questions. Has God made any direct statements about this, or are there any principles of Scripture that apply to it? Number two, what do I want to do? Because it's very possible that's coming from God as long as it lines up with Scripture. And thirdly, providentially, how has God arranged my life? What is he doing? So I may be making plans and looking it all out, but pay attention. What is God doing right now? I remember years ago, Lee read this book, John read this book. It's called Experiencing God. I don't know if you ever read that book, Joel. And this guy talks about he went to be a missionary up in Canada. And he said he went in there, he had all these plans. You know, we're going to do this as our seven-year plan. You know, you get a business plan together. We're going to do this in five years. We're going to do this in January. I got it all figured out. He goes up to Canada. He's following the game plan. And nothing's happening. I got all these perfect plans. Now, God, do something. Did you see my game plan? God, to follow the game plan. The game plan's not going according to plan. And then the guy said, wait a minute. I've been bouncing my head against the wall for all these years. Nothing's happening. And he says, you know what I decided to do? Instead of coming up with a game plan and asking God to bless it, he said, we decided to pay attention to what God is doing and join him. And he said, as soon as we did that, the church started to grow. That's why you guys have often heard us say in Down City, we're not going to tell God how he's going to build this church. We're going to watch how he does it. People that God brings in here. That tells us how he wants to build it. I've heard of these guys that go to start church and they say, we're going to target 
a certain segment of the culture. Wait a minute. You let God tell you what he wants and how the church to be made up and where he wants it to be. He'll show you. So one of the things you got to do in your life is pay attention to what God is doing in your life. Not just what you want and not just how you've laid out this perfect plan, but what do you observe God doing? How has he moved you? Where has he put you? What are the circumstances of your life? Pay attention to those. Because while you're making your plans, just remember, the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Man devises his way, but the Lord is directing his steps. I remember one time my dad used to share this quote of, Way back in 1957, there was this line in the Reader's Digest. A man said, life is what happens to us while we're making other plans. You're busy making plans, your life is happening. So pay attention to it. Now, I want to ask a couple of questions as we get to think about here to apply this to our life today. First of all, it's possible tonight you may say, God, I don't like what you're doing right now. This is not what I had planned. This is not what I wanted. How do you respond when God does things in your life that you don't like? He's not doing what you want. The famous book of the Bible that answers that question is Job. And Job says something very powerful in the second chapter. So go to Job chapter 2. Using the Bible we pass out here, it's page 418. Job chapter 2. If you don't know the story of Job, Job is a very faithful man. He's a good guy. He's got a large family. He's very, very wealthy. And we find out that Satan comes to God, and, and God says, Have you noticed my servant Job, how he's faithful to me, how he obeys me? And Satan says, Yeah, the only reason he does that is because you bless him. Take away all his blessings. Let's see if Job still loves you, God. And God says, all right. I'll let you, Satan, mess with him. You can't take his life. We'll, we'll have a little test. Sure enough, in one day, guys, it's amazing. Job loses all his wealth. All his kids die. It's incredible. You say, no one could ever survive going through what he goes through. It's amazing what he goes through in one day. He doesn't know... There's something bigger than he, that he's aware of going on between God and Satan. All he knows, he's living on the earth. He's trying to do the right thing. He's a good guy. And all of a sudden, his life's falling apart one day. And look what happens in Job chapter 2, page 418. Look what his wife says to him. She's a real help. She says in verse 9, his wife says to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. Come on, Job, just give up. Let God know what you really think about it. Exactly. Cut <laughs> Sorry to step on your toes there, dear sister. That's right. But she says to him, come on, Job, let's just tell God what you really think. We're all miserable. Just let him know what you think. Now look what happens in verse 10. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Look at this great this next line. Shall we receive good from God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Lord, you've been so good to me in my life, and if you decide right now in my life to put me through some hard times, if I've all, if I was willing always to accept the good, I'm willing also to accept the sin. I'm not going to argue with you about it. I'm not going to charge you that all of a sudden, God, you've been unkind to me. You quit loving me. You forgot me. I'm not going to charge you with those kind of things, God. And that's the response that we should have. I read my this past week, a friend of mine I went to college with, this guy has been through so much in one year. This guy, about a year ago, 12 months now, his sister died of COVID. Six months later, his father died of cancer. And this guy just announced last week to all of us, guys, I've got terrible news. I have just been diagnosed 
with a very aggressive form of melanoma. And the doctors have told me they're going to try to prolong my life. And this guy is, you know, in his early 50s, he lost his sister. He lost his dad. His, his son just got married. Is another child that just had their first grandchild, and now they've told him. You said, "How can one, how much can one person take it with?" And I appreciate his response. You know, it's been a response of, "We trust you, Lord." Now, guys, one thing we have to understand: sometimes you say, "This is not how I envision my life to go." This is not the way I would have done it. Just remember, many are the plans of the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. A man's steps are from the Lord. How can man understand his way? Do you think, do you think Roger Williams liked being kicked out of Salem, Massachusetts and hiking 55 miles in the wilderness? No. Do you think he would have rather settled there? Yes. But it was through all those closings and all those difficult times, God and his governance got him to where he needed to be. And this is true in your life. God is going to deal with you the same that he dealt with Roger Williams and the same he dealt with George Washington, the same he dealt with many people you've never heard of. This is a general truth of life. Plans belong to a man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Embrace that. It'll set you free. God, you are active in my life. You are doing things in my life. I'm looking for your will. What does scripture say? What are the desires you're putting in my heart? And what are you doing? You're showing me your will. Now, furthermore, I want to ask a second question for us to think about tonight, and that is in the Gospel of Luke. Turn there to chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, page 871 in the New Testament. And notice, beginning in verse 13 of Luke chapter 12, beginning in 13, page 871, And I'd like to ask Kevin if you would read this for us. 13, you're going to read to verse 21 of Luke chapter 12. I'll read it, but my translation is right there. Right. Then someone called from the crowd, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Jesus replied, That popped up. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to buy a Starbucks coffee right now. No. <laughs> Jesus replied, friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know, I'll, tell, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have enough room to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then we will get everything you worked for. 21. Oh, sorry. Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Yeah, so think about this, guys. While you're busy making all your plans in life, have you, do you remember that God's got something he's doing? You're so busy plotting and storing up and doing things, you don't know that tonight your life's going to be taken off the earth and all those things you focused on. Don't forget, the Lord's plans will stand. And the best way to enjoy life is to pay attention to what God's doing, enjoying Him. God, I receive what you're doing right now in my life. I receive it. I thank you for it. God loves you. God is righteous in all of his ways and kind in all of his works. That's his character. And one day, even if you don't fully know the whole story now, when you get to heaven, he's going to say, now that's why. Now you know the rest of the story. Does anybody remember there was used to be a radio guy, Paul Harvey? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and Paul Harvey, but it was, he was the most famous radio personality in America. 
and he would always tell a story. He'd be on page four, and he would tell this amazing story, real life, something happened in America, and there would always be this amazing twist at the end. And Paul Harvey would say, and now you know the rest of the story. <laughs> It's like, wow, I did not see that coming. And guys, that's true in all of our lives. God is going to write one day when you know the full story, you will agree with God that was the best way to do it. Sometimes you're in the middle of it. I know my father sometimes just says, he compares our lives like being a quilt, you know, and you're sitting under the person above you is weaving this master beautiful design but you're under it. When you're under the quilt, you see a lot of zigs and zags, and boy, this looks pretty ugly. But if you saw it from the top, you would see it's going somewhere. This is the case with all of God's children. So pay attention. Yes, God is at work in you, both the will to do his good pleasure. God wants to give you the desires of your heart. He's working in you so your desires line up with his good pleasures. And where they don't, checks them with his word. You submit them to his word and his principles. And then sometimes when your desires are good and they line up with scriptures and he still says no, it's because he has something better. I remember when we first started Down City, I remember my experience had been in a, in a youth ministry with, you, with, with a large youth group and the hundreds of kids would come and when I had been in the university, I was involved in things where we'd have hundreds and thousands of people. I remember we first came downtown, I thought, man, we're going to come in here, and boy, we're going to explode, and all these guys. <laughs> like, I did not know what was going to take. Like, I was going to have to go out and get a job. I'd been a full-time minister. I said, wow, that's not the way I drew it up. That's not the, that was not the game plan. When I was in seminary, if they said to me, now, Ted, what's your five? It wouldn't have been this. But then I say, okay, Lord, wow, I know all these, you know, all these times as we've been here. And you led me here and provided this way. And that's not the way I would have dreamed it. And yet, look at all the people I now know. And the ministry that we have in surprising ways. And we don't know what all this God is going to do next year or five years from now. That's why when I heard this past week the building was sold, I'm totally fine. Because I know God's devising the way. And I am absolutely confident that we're going to look back at it and say, well, that was perfect. That, well, that was, whoever did that was a genius. He said, yeah, yeah, my name's God. <laughs> One more to consider. Look at James chapter 4, verse 13. James 4, verse 13, page 1013 in the New Testament. Page 1013. James chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. And Gary, would you read these for us? Verses 13 to 17 of chapter 4. It says, Come now, you. Start there. 10, 13, 10, 13. verse 13. Right You're going to read from 13 to 17. Come now, you who, who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there, trade, make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist, a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, your boast and your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, Okay, so the scripture says, you know what? Don't don't be this foolish guy. Oh, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do that. I got it all laid out. And God says, oh yeah. You have no idea what tomorrow will bring. 
Yeah. You could be going along and man, you've got it all laid out and God changes those plans immediately. Now guys, here's how to really enjoy life. Ride the wave. Go along with what God's doing. God is good. He is righteous. He is kind. He's actively at work in your life. Just remember this. Plans belong to a man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. So, do what the missionary to Canada did. Start paying attention to what God's doing. And join him. As God's working your life, and he's working in your heart, and then your life takes on the bigger meaning. You start to say, wow, now I see where those dots connected. And that makes more sense now. And the God's going to use that in that difficult time. And now I see him bringing this whole puzzle together. And even where you don't, you trust. One day you will see. One day you will see it from the top. This is wisdom. This is how you live your life with skill. God shows you his will through direct statements of scripture. Like for example, what Gary just read in James. It would be wrong for me to arrogantly say, yeah, I'm gonna do this, and I got life totally under control. That's arrogance. You don't know about tomorrow. Instead, what you ought to say, if the Lord wills, I will live and I will do this or that. By the way, that doesn't mean you don't make plans. Plans do belong to man. You should make plans. You should be wise. You should, and, and scripture will help you to be wise. Think about your life. You don't just live life. Whatever happens, happens. No, you get out there and you make plans. Like Conti, you want to make things better for your family. You're going, it's good. You're going to school. You're working hard. That's great. We're, we, as a church, we're being wise, saying, okay, Lord, what about this? Is this a possibility? Should, we met with the owner. We threw out this possibility. We attempted maybe pay, possibly raise funds to purchase a building. We're, we're trying to be wise. But whatever the Lord's going to do, we pay attention to that. We accept it. This is how we live our life. We say, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm, this is where I'm at right now in life. This is what's going on. What does your word say? What are your principles? I want to follow them. I pay attention. I know you're good. You're a good father. You're going to put good desires in my heart. And I'm going to say, man, I, those very well might be from you. Make sure they line up with scripture, but a third way I'm going to pay attention. What are you doing? What are your acts of providence? How are you maneuvering my life around? Pay attention to that and enjoy it. Then you're free. You're free. You're flexible. God can work in your life. God can do surprising things. And you trust him. And you're filled with all joy and peace and so this is wisdom for living. Let's pray. Lord, help us to think about this truth. Pay attention in our lives what you are doing. Lord, we thank you for the fact that you are at work in our lives in surprising ways, even through things that are difficult and hard. You have made a promise. You are going to make all things, there are no exceptions, even painful things, work together for good. To those who love you, for those who are called according to your purpose, and we know that purpose is to declare how great you are. You're going to make everything in our life fulfill that purpose. So we praise you for that, Lord, for the good times, the bad times, the blessings, the trials. All of them are going to fulfill that purpose. May we honor you by our trust and by our delight through all those different times. We pray in Jesus' name.